Well, good morning. Welcome to session number 14 in our study of the incredible book of Exodus, powerful truths that have stood the test of time that continue to impact us through the centuries and that have incredible relevance for us today. We're going to be taking a look this morning at the giving of the law at Mount Sinai. Exodus 19 and 20 are two of the most important chapters, not only in this book, but in the entire Bible. And they have so much to say to followers of Jesus today, to people around the world. They have so much to say to our culture today because these words given to Moses at Mount Sinai are the foundation for Western culture and law. Unfortunately, that foundation is crumbling today. And uh, it's so important for us to rebuild that foundation in our own lives so that that too may have an impact on our culture. I'd like to start this morning with prayer, but I'd like to begin our prayer with a word from Scripture. This is from Psalm 119 that seems especially appropriate as we take a look at the giving of the law. Psalm 119, beginning at verse 1. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. Powerful words, aren't they? And certainly applicable. Let's begin with prayer. Lord our God, we come into your holy presence this morning. We come before you with humility, with awe, with reverence, with repentant spirits. We pray that today your Holy Spirit would speak into each one of our lives. We pray that you would reveal yourself to us in your word. And we pray that we would be transformed as we look at your life-giving word and truth. May the Lord Jesus, Israel's Messiah and the Savior of the nations, be exalted among us today. And may he be honored in our lives as we bear witness to you, the living God. Amen. Well, we are going to pick up where we had left off last week as we're studying this great book of Exodus. You'll recall we have seen how God delivered the children of Israel from bondage in Egypt through a series of 10 plagues, led them through the wilderness by means of a pillar of cloud in the daytime and a pillar of fire at night, brought them through the waters of the Red Sea, destroyed Pharaoh's chariots and army, as though the waters of the sea came back over them, led them into the wilderness to Rephidim, where he gave them water out of a rock. And now we come to chapter 19, which sets the stage for the high point, really, of the book of Exodus, and that is the giving of the law. As God now reveals himself in a powerful way to his children, whom he has already redeemed, so if you would open your Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus, chapter 19, beginning at verse 1, and uh, that's where we are going to pick up here this morning. We read these words. On the first day of the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. A and so now we are a period of perhaps uh, about 40 days or so after their deliverance from bondage in Egypt. And they come now to the desert of Sinai, to the, uh, the, the holy ground, really, that will lead them up to Mount Sinai, the place where God will unveil his law for the Israelites. It, it is rather significant to note that the ancient Jewish people, as they looked at the book of Exodus, speculated on the basis of the material that we have that it took the Israelites 50 days from the time of their Passover deliverance until the law was given to them at Mount Sinai. But please note, we have come to a point here, Exodus 19, verse 1, where they have not yet gone to the mountain. They've not yet received the law, but they have come to the desert of Sinai. In other words, they are close to their destination. 
It is approximately 40 days since the Passover. Now think about that for just a second. And, and, and this is pure speculation, but isn't it interesting that it was 40 days after his resurrection that Jesus was taken up and uh, left word with his disciples to make disciples of all the nations. Now the Israelites are getting close to their ultimate destination, Mount Sinai. Uh, I shouldn't say ultimate destination, their, their incredibly important destination. And uh, they draw near to the desert of Sinai about 40 days after their deliverance. It'll be another 10 days or so, according to Jewish tradition, when they receive the law. That receiving of the law has been typically celebrated by the Jewish people throughout the centuries with a special feast, one of the three great pilgrim festivals. The first great pilgrim festival, of course, is, is uh, Passover. The second great pilgrim festival is, is what is known, what is known as the Feast of Weeks, a, a period of a number of weeks a total of seven weeks, 50 days after Passover. It is known in the New Testament world as Pentecost. For the Jewish people, it is the great feast of weeks, a great celebration. They commemorate the giving of the law. For those who follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it is no accident that it's during that celebration that the Holy Spirit is given. Jewish tradition was that the law was offered to all the nations of the world, but only one nation would accept it. That, however, is not what the book of Exodus says. The book of Exodus tells us that God chose the Jewish people because God is good and gracious. It's not that they were better than any other people. He chose them specifically to be the instruments through whom he would bring the knowledge of the living God to the world. That is at the heart of the Bible's message, and that is at the heart of what we're going to be looking at here today. But it is no accident that when all things are being fulfilled by Messiah, those things are fulfilled in a manner that is consistent with the Hebrew Scriptures and reflects what we see right here. And so we're going to be coming back to that on a number of occasions as we continue our study of Exodus. But before we go any further, let's get back to the text, okay? Exodus 19, on the first day of the third month, they come to the desert of Sinai. And then verse 2, after they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. And so again, I would call you your attention back to this diagram that we had taken a look at last week, utilizing a Venn diagram to try to express what we seem to be seeing here in the book of Exodus, namely that Rephidim is in the area of known as Horeb, that it's at the rock at Horeb that the water is poured out, but the Israelites leave the desert at Rephidim and come over here to the desert of Sinai, or perhaps better translated, the wilderness of Sinai. And, and they come then to the mountain, to the mount where Moses had first encountered God 40 years earlier at the burning bush, when God put his hand on Moses and called him to be his man to lead the children of Israel out of bondage, God chooses wisely. And the man Moses, as we have seen, is one who is uniquely qualified, uniquely equipped, and uniquely prepared to lead God's children. That doesn't mean it went smoothly. It did not. Uh, God's children have always been a rather rebellious, recalcitrant bunch, and that still applies to us today. It is so important that we learn from these things, to follow the Lord wholeheartedly, without reservation, without hesitation, no matter the cost, no matter the price, no matter the calling. And so now, here the Israelites have finally come in the area of Horeb to the wilderness of Sinai and camp near the mount, the mount where Moses had encountered God. A couple of things here uh, are worth commenting on, and I've been alluding to these in the past, and I'd, I'd like to spend a little bit more time on them right now, and that concerns the location of Sinai. 
and, and why some have questioned the traditional site that has been uh, that has been reverenced really for the last uh, 1600 years or so. I would remind you that, first of all, the area that uh, is often called Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula, it, the Sinai Peninsula was not called that until the early 1800s. And the, the location that was commonly reverenced uh, frankly, has no no documentation earlier than the the fourth and fifth centuries A.D. Uh, what we do have, however, is this: some of the earliest Christian authors and scholars, including Eusebius, a uh, brilliant historian who who wrote uh, an early history of the church. Uh, Eusebius lived from uh, right around uh, 260 to 340 A.D. And uh, his, his work on the history of the church, the uh, ecclesiastical history, is still available today and, and is one of the uh, primary sources, really, for understanding much of the early Jesus movement. Another individual, Jerome, who lived in Palestine, as it was then called. Keep in mind, uh, the, the land of Israel was renamed by the Romans after the Jewish revolt. They named it Palestina. Uh, they, they named it after the Philistines, Israel's historic enemies. Jerome lived in Palestine, and uh, he is the translator of the Bible into Latin, what's known as the Vulgate. Both Jerome and Eusebius mention in their writings that Moses went to the land of Midian, where he met God at the mount, and they correctly located the land of Midian, where we today know on the basis of research it is and was, and that is in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the Apostle Paul is another individual who speaks about Mount Sinai being in Arabia. And he makes a very fascinating point that is often, frankly, often ignored, but, but gives us some real insight, I believe. And, and so I'm going to change this map just a little bit, add a couple of things here. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles for just a moment to the book of Galatians chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, where we read these words of the Apostle Paul. Now, Paul is writing to uh, early believers, individuals who have come out of a pagan background, non-Jewish people, Gentiles, and, and he is writing to them about our heritage and how we have come to know the living God who revealed himself to Moses, to the Jewish people, and, and now has revealed himself fully in the Messiah, Jesus, our Savior and Lord. And this is what the Apostle Paul writes in uh, Galatians chapter 4, beginning in verse 25, he's talking about Hagar, and Hagar, you will recall, was Sarah's maid uh, who ended up bearing a son to Abraham known as Ishmael. Uh, today, the, the Muslim people see themselves as descendants of Abraham through Ishmael. But uh, Hagar was, uh, was an individual who had a deep trust in God, and yet the Lord made it very clear. The promise he had made to Abraham was not going to come through Hagar. The promise would come through Sarah, a miraculous promise. Sarah would conceive and bear a son at a time when it was, well, it was humanly impossible. This, then, is what Paul writes. He says, now Hagar... Sarah's maid. Now, Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. Please note that. Paul is talking about Sinai, and he says it's in Arabia, and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. Now, Paul is making a very profound theological point, but he is also using a, 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 an incredible analogy. And he uses some very fascinating language here. He says, as it's translated here, uh, Mount Sinai in Arabia, which corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem. Well, what does that mean, corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem? Well, Paul is really pulling a play on words here, and he uses a word that is found nowhere else in the New Testament. It's the word, Systoic 
systoikeo, systoikeo. It means, it, here it's called, it's translated corresponds. It literally means stands in line with. In fact, it is often used as a geographic term to indicate that something, it follows on a line that runs due north and south. And that is the word that Paul uses when he says Mount Sinai in Arabia stands in line with the present city of Jerusalem. We would express it this way. We would say it's on the same longitude as Jerusalem. And what is so fascinating is that the site that has been identified by many as the possible site of Mount Sinai in the Jebel Allah's range in the land north of the land of Midian in modern day Saudi Arabia, it is almost, almost directly uh, due south of Jerusalem. The traditional site is not, but this site is. And it corresponds, as I mentioned earlier, with what early Christian witnesses say about the location of the mountain in Arabia and what the Apostle Paul says as well. And uh, it's one reason why I don't think we should just slough off this possible explanation. I, I believe, quite frankly, it has far better biblical support than the site that is often pointed to by many today. Again, only time will tell. Perhaps we will find conclusive evidence that makes that absolutely obvious and true. And by the way, in the weeks to come, I'll be sharing with you a little bit of evidence that really does make you wonder some things that have been found at the site in Saudi Arabia. But uh, whether that is the site or not, the fact is the Israelites now come to the land of the wilderness of Sinai and they go up to Mount Sinai, where they will receive the law of God. And uh, it's there that we continue in uh, the book of Exodus, chapter 19. These words, verse 3. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. Verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, this is one of those unique places where the Torah in general and uh, Exodus in particular uses poetic language to describe the work of God. And the Lord says, you yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt. In other words, look back at what I did to that land. Look what happened through the plagues and through the deliverance of Passover. What happened in the waters of the sea. Look back and you see how I have carried you on eagle's wings. Now, what is that all about? A dear friend of mine, a friend of mine that goes back to uh, kindergarten and grade school, uh, an individual who is a uh, an Orthodox rabbi in Jerusalem today, had, had pointed to me a number of months ago, uh, suggested that I read a commentary by Dennis Prager on the book of Exodus. And I've done that, and it's fascinating. It comes from a Jewish standpoint. But one thing that especially stood out for me as I read Prager's commentary is a comment that he mentioned from Rashi. Rashi is a French rabbi from the uh, 11th century AD. He is well known among Orthodox Jewish people and, and greatly revered, brilliant man, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzhaki. Uh, that's where they get Rashi. Ra -shi -yi. Okay, Rashi. Rashi, almost a thousand years ago, made this comment about what God was communicating when he says, I've carried you on eagle's wings. Here's what Rashi said. He said, other birds carry their young between their legs to protect them from enemies coming down on them from above. The eagle, on the other hand, puts her young on her back because no one can fly higher than an eagle. And if you think about that, no one is greater. No one is higher than God. He's carried us on eagle's wings.
a, a beautiful poetic picture, not just simply of God's preserving and protecting power, but of God's glory and majesty on eagle's wings above all the rest. None of the birds can come close and none of the attackers can succeed because he is all powerful. He flies highest of all. Love that. I, brilliant, I think, and just a powerful picture here. Well, let's continue on, shall we? Verse six or verse five and six then. Uh, verse five, God says, now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations, you will be my treasured possession. In other words, God is saying, I have delivered you and now you are to follow me. Please note, this is so important and we will emphasize it again when we get to the Ten Commandments. God delivers them before he gives them his law. They are not saved because they've obeyed his law. They are saved because God is good. But God also makes it very clear, because I've intervened in your life, you are now to follow me. And I will use you and I will, I will bless you in such a phenomenal way that you will have an impact on all of the nations. Th this is radical stuff. You know, in the ancient world, kings and the wealthy and the high and mighty were seen, seen as being individuals who could have an impact on others. But the average human being was looked upon as basically insignificant. The Torah changes that. God changes that. Every Israelite is precious to him. And his desire is to use every Israelite as his treasured possession to bring to the nations, to all the nations, uh, the good news of what he has done. You will be my unique and special people, God says. But he doesn't stop there. He says, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you're to speak to the Israelites. God is talking to Moses and he says, communicate this to them. God is saying, each and every one of you are important to me. You're my treasured possession. And I'm going to make of all of you, I'm going to make you an entire kingdom of priests, a holy nation so that others may know the living God. It's what God had first expressed to Abraham. Through you, all nations on earth will be blessed. And dear friends, that is historically accurate. The Jewish people have had the major influence on culture throughout the centuries. What God revealed at Sinai, what God reveals in the Torah is something that is the foundation of Western culture in particular, but it is the foundation of much of the views of much of the world. It is a moral view of, of the human race, a moral view of history. It is an understanding there is a God who is over all, who is good and gracious and merciful, who is all powerful and holy, and who is to also then be trusted as well as obeyed. Because if you trust, you will obey. If you love, you will follow. If you believe, you will act. The two are intimately connected, and God is making that clear here. But there is also a word of blessing and hope here for those of us who are not Jewish. You see, God says that the Israelites will be for him a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. The New Testament reveals that God has now expanded it to include everything he promised Abraham. Through you, all nations will be blessed. Listen to what the apostle Peter, himself a devout Jew, says about these very words from Exodus 19, verse six. This is in Peter's first letter, written uh, probably just a, a matter of months or uh, at most a few years before Peter died a martyr's death for the cause of Jesus. But this is what Peter writes to a group of believing people, 
primarily Gentiles, in the area that we today know as Turkey. And he says to them, verse 5 of chapter 2, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. What Peter is saying is now Gentiles who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, they also have been taken into the family of God. And we also now have become a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. Uh, the, the very language that is used here in Exodus 19 is used by the apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2. That is profound, but it is also essential that we understand what that really means. Sadly, one of the greatest heresies among followers of Jesus over the last 20 centuries has been a heresy that first showed its head just a matter of years after the death of the apostles. And it was a heresy that said, God has replaced Israel with the Christian church. That is not biblical. Not only is it heretical, it is absolutely dangerous and f just fully contrary to everything we see in the scriptures. God does not abandon his children. God rebukes them when they go astray. God brings, allows punishment to come on them when they disobey. But God is faithful and he does not break his covenant and he does not break his word. What we read in the New Testament, specifically in the Apostle Paul's writings to the Romans, Romans 9, 10, and 11, uh, what, what Paul tells us is that we who are followers of Jesus, who come from the Gentile, the non-Jewish world, we have been grafted in to the, the true vine, the, the, uh, the people of God. We are not to boast about that. We're not to brag about it. We're not to look down on the Jewish people. To the contrary, we're to praise and thank God for the way they have brought blessings to the world. We are also to set an example so the Jewish people who do not yet recognize Jesus as Messiah will be drawn to him as they see the way God is moving in the non-Jewish world and transforming and renewing lives through the power of his Holy Spirit. Uh, that is something that this anticipates, that the New Testament declares. But we also need to be very careful that we do not fall into the, the dangerous attitude that somehow Christianity has usurped Judaism. No, we have been brought into the family of God. And we are called now to lead all people Gentile and Jewish, to a knowledge of the Messiah of Israel, Jesus, the hope of the nations, the hope of the world, the King of Kings, our returning King. The day is coming when King David's descendant will rule the world. And that's what we need to keep in mind here. Well, let's go on, shall we? Taking a look at what follows, Exodus 19, verse 7. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all the words the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people responded together. Love this. The people all responded together. We will do everything the Lord has said. Boy, what a great thing to declare. What a great thing to say. Now let's do it. And that's where so often God's people fall short not only the ancient Israelites in the wilderness, but God's people in every generation and every century since. It is one thing to give God lip service. Everything you have said, we will do. It is another thing to do what he has said. Now, please note, this is not suggesting that we are saved by our actions, by our works, by our good deeds. That is something that goes absolutely contrary to everything we see in the Bible. And that's not just in the New Testament. That is in the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament as well. Everything we do is a response to what God has done. We are not saved by our obedience, by our faithfulness. Because we are saved, 
We are freed to obey. And because we believe, we choose to obey. Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him. He calls us to be his disciples. It's rather interesting how that word is used in the New Testament. You know, so often today in the quote unquote Christian world, we talk about believers and church members. Those words are alien and rare in the New Testament. In the New Testament, the word that is used primarily to describe a follower of Jesus is the word disciple. A disciple is a learner, one who learns from the Lord Jesus, who puts his words and his truth into action. A disciple is one who is saved by grace and by that grace now serves and follows the living God. And that's what God is telling his people in every age. At Sinai, the Jewish people, I, I should say the Israelites, because the term Jewish was not used until many centuries later. But the Israelites said, we will do everything the Lord has said. And yet what we will see very quickly is those words were mere lip service. They're a reminder to us to make sure that our profession is more than lip service. It is life service. Let's continue. Verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud so that the people will hear me speaking with you and will always put their trust in you. Then Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Moses and God are having one-on-one -on -one conversation here. Moses has experienced this before, first at Mount Sinai 40 years earlier. And then, after 40 years in the wilderness, called by God for the next 40 years to serve him leading the children of Israel. And God communicates with Moses in a very direct way. Now, there's a natural reaction here that many people have. Well, why doesn't God do that with everybody? Part of the reason is what we're going to see here in Exodus 19 because the Israelites will say, we don't want to hear from God personally. <laughs> he, it's scary. And uh, they will say, Moses, you, you go, you talk with him for us. Uh, God communicates in power, but he calls his people to listen. And he calls his people to hear. And as he speaks, we are to respond. So we read then verse 10. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes and be ready by the third day, because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Be prepared is what God is saying. He says, consecrate the people. In other words, set them apart for holy service. They're going to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation chosen by God to declare his goodness and his glory. So consecrate them, set them apart. And in three days, isn't that interesting? How often in the scriptures do we read in three days or on the third day or, <laughs> yeah, God so often moves on that third day, doesn't he? And now as the Israelites have camped out by Sinai, as the time for God's visitation draws near, they are told, be consecrated. In fact, tell them to wash their clothes. Now, why in the world would God say something like that? Wash their clothes. <laughs> the answer is they've been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 plus days. They're dirty. They're filthy. And they are about to have an encounter with the living God. And when you meet the living God, you want to take him seriously. Moses is told, consecrate the people. Tell them to wash their clothes. You know, growing up, we always put on what was called our quote unquote Sunday best to go to worship. 
Now, many look at that and say, well, you don't have to wear fancy clothes to be a worshiper of the living God. And that's true. But we are to reverence God. And, and quite frankly, I believe we've lost a lot in our culture as we have failed to grapple with that and have taken a rather lighthearted approach toward the living God. The Israelites are told, wash their clothes, be ready by the third day, because on that day, the Lord will come down on Mount Sinai. And this sets the stage for one of the most remarkable events in all of human history. As God comes down in a dramatic fashion on a holy mountain. Well, let's continue on, shall we? Verse 12, God tells Moses, put limits for the people around the mountain and tell them, be careful that you do not approach the mountain or touch the foot of it. Whoever touches the mountain is to be put to death. In other words, this is serious. And again, in our culture, we don't take anything seriously. But God is to be taken seriously. And he tells the children of Israel, don't even touch the mountain. This is holy ground. When Moses first encountered God in the burning bush on Mount Sinai, what was he told? Take off your sandals because the ground on which you are standing is holy ground. Wherever God is, is holy ground. And the Israelites are told, treat this with reverence, holy awe. Be in awe of God. In fact, the phrase that is frequently used in the Hebrew Bible to fear God literally means to be in awe of, to be in absolute awe of the living God. That is where you and I need to be, I might add, in absolute awe of the living God. He is God. He is not to be taken lightly. He is good. He is gracious. He is holy. And that means we are to treat him with holy reverence, set apart, set apart to do his will, set apart to be his priests, his holy nation, to impact the world, to impact the nations. Well, the Lord goes on. Verse 13, they are to be stoned or shot with arrows. Not a hand is to be laid on them. No person or animal shall be permitted to live. Only when the ram's horn sounds a long blast, may they approach the mountain. Now, in this day and age, again, people often look at that and say, well, that is so archaic. And what God is saying is, he is so holy. It's why the New Testament declares it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. If we do not approach him with faith, with reverence, if we do not take him seriously, we are guilty of cosmic treason. That's really what it amounts to. It is treasonous behavior against the creator of the universe. And so God wants to underline the importance of this encounter for the children of Israel. They're told, don't even come near the mountain. Don't touch it. You can't even come near until you hear the sound of the trumpet blast, the sound of the shofar. There's one right up there. <laughs> the sound of the shofar. Verse 14. After Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said to the people, prepare yourselves for the third day abstain from sexual relations. Now, is God saying here that sex is bad? That is not what this is about. God is the author of sex. Now, that doesn't mean that we are to uh, behave in an unbiblical manner. Sex is good in the confines that God has established in the marriage relationship between a man and a woman who've committed themselves together in a covenant for life. But what the Lord is saying here, what Moses is communicating to the people is this. 
This is not to be life as usual right now. You are to prepare yourself. You are to be dedicated wholly to the Lord. And you are about to see something that no other people has ever seen. So be prepared, be ready, be absolutely consecrated to this. Moses is teaching former slaves how to live as free men and women of God. And God has communicated very clearly, here is how you are to behave in preparation for what I am about to do and the appearance I am about to make before you. Let's go on. Verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there's again that third day thing. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Uh, you know, try to picture this. Here they are at the foot of the mountain. And, and suddenly, huge clouds, lightning, thunder, and a loud trumpet blast blowing that gets louder and louder. And, and I, I mean, this is the sort of thing that causes you to be absolutely undone. And the, the children of Israel, they, they're terrified by what they're seeing. It is a reminder, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But they have also seen the gracious hand of the living God who has carried them on eagle's wings and has brought them to this place. And so Moses continues to relate what happened next as he writes and says, Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. And then, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. Imagine experiencing that as this incredible, incredible event, fire and smoke and and the sounding of the trumpet and the mountain shaking. And now Moses speaks and God answers. Verse 20, the Lord descended to the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses went up and the Lord said to him, go down and warn the people so they do not force their way through to see the Lord and many of them perish. Now, our natural response is, well, Moses has already told them that. God told Moses that earlier when he'd gone up on the mountain the first time. You know, why does he need to repeat himself? And the answer is, at least in part, because God knows human nature. And so, Moses is called up by the very voice of God. And he's told, now remind the people not to come up the mountain lest they perish. Verse 22, even the priests who approach the Lord must consecrate themselves or the Lord will break out against them. And then verse 23, Moses said to the Lord, The people cannot come up Mount Sinai because you yourself warned us, put limits around the mountain and set it apart as holy. The Lord replied, go down and bring Aaron up with you. But the priests and the people must not force their way through to come up to the Lord or he will break out against them. The third time now God says that. And again, if you're asking, well, why repeat it so often? Any parent knows the answer to that question because wayward children need to hear it over and again. And this event is one that certainly would have evoked a great deal of curiosity from the children of Israel. You know, let's just, what if we just go up a little way up the mountain? You know, just get a little bit closer. And God is saying, no, you stay down there. But Moses and Aaron, the two of you come up. Verse 25, so Moses went down to the people and told them. And now we come to chapter 20. This is what we read. 
and God spoke all these words. Now, that's a very short sentence, a very short phrase. It's one verse in our Bibles, but it is incredibly important. And God spoke all these words. Please note it does not say, and Moses said, or here's what Moses wrote, or here's what is written in the commandments. No, it says, and God spoke all these words. This is God talking. And that means these words carry incredible authority. God spoke all these words. Now, in our Bibles, very often, there will be a, um, a, a designator on this section of Scripture uh, that says something like the Ten Commandments. Where does that phrase come from? It doesn't come from Exodus 20. Nowhere in Exodus 20 is the phrase the Ten Commandments used. So where does that come from? And the answer is Exodus 34, verse 28, and Deuteronomy 4, verse 13. Aseret Hadevarim is the Hebrew. And uh, if you hang on to Exodus 20 for just a second and move over to Exodus 34, verse 28, this is what we read. I'm going to take the last half of verse 28. It says, And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Also in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 4. Uh, by the way, the Ten Commandments are repeated in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 5. But in Deuteronomy, chapter 4, verse 13, we read these words. Moses is writing and he says, He declared to you, meaning God, God declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you to follow, and then wrote them on two stone tablets. Ten Commandments is the way it is traditionally translated, although the Hebrew literally means ten statements. The ten statements. And, and that is the way the Jewish people have interpreted those, those words for centuries. Now, the Ten Commandments is accurate. Um, the Ten Statements is the way it's described in Hebrew. What's fascinating is the statements are not numbered. And people have, have debated over the centuries how to number them. There are a variety of numbering systems that have been proposed. According to the great Jewish rabbis, the system that they have used is commandment number one is verse number two which is not the way Christian people have traditionally looked at the Ten Commandments. Verse number two says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. The rabbi said, that's the first statement. I will say this. What matters when it comes to the Ten Commandments is not how you number them. It's whether you listen to them. <laughs> These are the words the Lord spoke. That's what we're told. And they are words that need to be heard. God begins by telling the Israelites in verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Now, why does God say that? Why does he not say, I'm the God of Abraham? Or, I'm the God who created you? Why does he say, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery? Because he's reminding them he is not simply the God who created them. He is not merely the God who has made promises to their ancestors. He is the God who delivered them. And what follows is a response to his deliverance. I believe the rabbis are right on when they call this the first of the, the ten words. Because God is saying, I'm your deliverer. And because he's your deliverer. Here is the way you are to behave. Today, many have lost the significance, lost sight of the significance of the Ten Commandments because they are really unique in world history. This is the first time ever in all of recorded history that behavior 
has been connected to the knowledge and worship of God. In the ancient world, you did anything because the gods were ungodly. What mattered is you went through ritual. And what God is saying is, I brought you out of bondage. I brought you out of the land of slavery. Therefore, here is how you are to live. It is a moral code because God is a moral God. And he is not to be taken lightly. And that is something we need to carefully consider as we study these words in Exodus chapter 20. I recognize the danger of legalism, and we will talk about that next week. I recognize the danger of legalism that says I'm saved because of my obedience. That is wrong. But the other danger, the flip side of the coin, is antinomianism. The notion that I can be a believer in God and live as I darn well please. And the fact is, because I'm a believer in the living God, I want to live the way he pleases. And I want to live to please him. And so the Lord is telling the Israelites, first of all, I'm the God who delivered you. There's also a subtle reminder here. You see, it's easy to forget what God has done. And we've already seen that with the Israelites. Remember, they're complaining at the waters of the sea. Weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you had to bring us out here to die in the desert? And then they're moaning when they didn't have enough to eat and said, back in Egypt, oh, we had such great food. You know, the restaurants in Egypt were amazing. And God is saying, I brought you out of the land of slavery. You were slaves and now you're free. I've delivered you. Never forget that. You know, throughout Israel's history, there was a tendency to look longingly back on Egypt. As the Israelites fell further and further away from God, they wanted to depend on Egypt to protect them from their enemies, the Babylonians and the Assyrians. And what God is saying is, Egypt is the land of slavery. I delivered you from that. Don't lose sight of that truth. By the way, there's no denying that ancient Egypt was an amazing amazing country. The, the tremendous buildings in Egypt that still stand today, you, know, you have to stand in awe of the pyramids, the Sphinx, the great temples of the ancient Egyptians. But the fact of the matter is those things were built at a cost. Let me give you a classic example of that. It's the example of a pharaoh who ruled in Egypt a number of centuries later than this. A pharaoh whose name is mentioned, actually, in the Hebrew scriptures in the book of Second Kings. The pharaoh's name is Necho. He is the Egyptian pharaoh who went to attack the Assyrians, moved through the land of Judah, and King Josiah, godly king, went out to oppose him. From what we read in Second Kings and what we read in Second Chronicles, it appears that Necho was acting at the direction of God. Uh, Josiah didn't recognize that. Josiah ended up dying in battle. But there's something else we know about Nico. And it really is fascinating, and it fits with this so well. You know, the Egyptians were looked on as powerful. After the destruction of Judah, the uh, Judeans who remained, many of them chose to disobey God, to go against what the prophet Jeremiah said and go back to Egypt because it was a glistening, beautiful place, but it was built on bondage. Here's a classic example that revolves around Pharaoh Necho. This is from Herodotus's histories. Herodotus is frequently referred to as the father of history. Um, I don't believe that's the case. I believe Moses is, quite honestly, and Moses lived hundreds of years earlier. And what we have here in the Torah, uh, it predates Herodotus by many centuries. But here's what Herodotus tells us about Nico. Uh, he says that Nico actually tried to build a massive canal, the precursor of the Suez Canal. It was a canal that would stretch from the Nile River, 
down to the Red Sea. And this is what Herodotus writes. He said, the digging of this canal in Nico's reign cost the lives of 120,000 Egyptians. But that's a spit in the bucket for those who rule in their own power instead of in the power of the living God. And Herodotus goes on to say, midway through the excavations, however, Nico was prompted to abandon the entire project by an oracle, which warned him that all his efforts would end up serving the needs of a barbarian. Barbarian, I should explain, is a word applied by the Egyptians to all who do not speak their tongue. It's real easy to look back on what was and say, oh, it was so good back there. And what God is saying is, he is good. And we look to him. He's telling them, I brought you out of Egypt. Don't long to return. I delivered you. Don't go back to slavery. You are free. Now live as free men and women of the living God. And it's at that point then that God gives what many of us call the first commandment. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall have no other gods before me. That's the traditional translation. I really prefer the footnote in the NIV. You shall have no other gods besides me. Before is a traditional way of translating the Hebrew, but it really means no other gods. It doesn't mean, well, have God first, and then you can have these little gods in your life. No, God and God alone. And uh, that commandment is at the heart, the heart of God and the heart of the Ten Commandments. If you acknowledge this one, the others will fall in line because if God is God in our lives, it changes everything. One of the most important phrases that I heard from a dear pastor friend of mine who is now with the Lord was this one, let God be God. I believe that's very important to allow God to be God in our lives. You shall have no other gods. Now, many times when 21st century Westerners hear or read these words, they immediately think of, of idols and statues. Uh, and frequently our reaction is, well, that's something they did in the past. We don't do that sort of thing anymore. Idolatry is just as rampant today as it ever was. Because idolatry is not simply bowing down to a statue. Idolatry is setting up anything above God in our lives. Let, let me take a look at some of the false deities that are very much a part of 21st century Western culture. Materialism, first of all. The attitude that it's stuff that matters. People devote their lives to the accumulation of things. That's idolatry. In fact, the New Testament tells us that that kind of greed is idolatry. A, a second thing, education. Education is one of the great idols of American culture. You know, more and more education. If you're only educated, then, then you have reached the top. And what the Bible tells us is that education without God is deceptive. And education does not lead to betterment in and of itself. Education without morals, education without the law is deadly. Classic example, Nazi Germany the best educated society in the world's history. Many of the leaders of Nazi Germany had their advanced degrees, uh, doctorates in a variety of areas. Uh, a perfect example of that is the one that, that comes from a, a background that I am very familiar with. A brilliant German Lutheran Christian, brilliant scholar by the name of Gerhard Kittel. Gerhard Kittel wrote a massive 10 volume work, the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. I have that translated in English in my own library. 
and it deals with the use of various Greek words in the New Testament scriptures. It is a brilliant accomplishment of scholarship and education. But what do we know about Gerhard Kittel? He joined the Nazi party and many of the things that he said and wrote were actually used by the Nazis to support their policies against the Jews. Education is a false god. Education without the knowledge of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the Bible says. And education without God and without a bedrock of truth, of right and wrong, good and evil, is deceptive and can be incredibly destructive. Love is another deity. I was growing up in the 1960s and the 1970s. Free love. Make love, not war. But love that is not anchored in truth and love that is not anchored in right and wrong and good and evil is a false God. And finally, if I may conclude, religion can be a false deity. Many things have been done in the name of religion, and they are far removed from the things of God. And frankly, people can worship religion and not know God. But what God says is, you shall have no other gods. By the way, one final note, you shall have no other gods. In English, you can be singular or plural. In Hebrew, it is either singular or it is plural. It can't be the both simultaneously. So what does the Hebrew say here? The answer is, it is singular. You, you singular shall have no other gods. God is speaking to all his people, but he's speaking to us personally. And by the way, every one of the commandments is in the singular. It's addressed to the nation and it is for the nations. It is God's moral law, but it is singular because it's to you and to me personally. And that's where we have to end. Our time is up. We will pick up there next week. Right now, let's conclude with a word of prayer. Lord, our God, we bow before you in reverence. We tremble in awe at your majesty, but we revel and rejoice in your steadfast love and faithfulness, your goodness in Jesus, our Messiah and Savior. We thank you that by faith in him, you have grafted us into your people. We thank you that by faith in him, you have given us your Holy Spirit. We thank you that by faith in him, you are transforming us from within into the very image of God. Lord, may your work in our lives continue and may we faithfully follow and obey you as the fruit and natural response of genuine faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God bless you, my dear friends. We'll see you same time, same place next week as we pick up with our study of the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20.